All right, so this lab is going to be on priming the circuits. We have done two labs prior to this on circuit design and then construction of your own circuit. Hopefully, we're gonna find out. You remember last week we talked about this is where the rubber meets the road. Your circuit gonna hold water. Your boat gonna float on the ocean, right? Now we're gonna find out because we're gonna put fluid in. There is a, a specific order of priming that we're gonna teach you. Like always, we try to teach the safest way, right? We try to teach the safest way, but of all of these labs that we've talked about, different than initiation, different than maintenance, different than termination of bypass, priming is more individualized by your circuit design, by your institution, by how you built the circuit and different things like that. Also, by the rapidity of which you need to prime. If this is an emergency, you're gonna prime very differently than if you have a surgery in two hours. Does that make sense? Obviously, what, what's the most important part of, the, of your heart and lung machine setup? The pump, what's the, the part, it's three parts. What's that called, your what? AV your AV loop, why? Because what can you do with an AV loop? Yes, you could save somebody's life. You can go on bypass, get them on bypass, save somebody's life with your AV loop. You don't need cardioplegia. You don't need a hemoconcentrator. You don't need your water lines on. You don't need, you need your gases and your AV loop. In some cases, you don't even need an oxygenator, right? VV ECMO, you can save, save somebody's life by getting them on and letting their lungs continue to support. But the AV loop is the most important part to prime. We're gonna focus on that in this process. So again, we're gonna write this out. We're gonna teach this as the safest way to go through uh, in your mind and to practice knowing that you're gonna go on a whole bunch of different clinical rotations and you're going to learn a lot of different methods in different ways. Does that make sense? So, first thing we need to do, first thing we need to do has nothing to do with priming at all, but it has everything to do with these previous two labs. And I'm not gonna ask you a lot of these things because I know it's gonna be hard to come up with. But the first one, the first one is we want to ensure that our circuit is complete, ensure that our circuit is free of any defect, make sure everything's tight. So who wants to come up with a way to, to say that? We're gonna assure that our circuit is what? Sound. Assure the soundness of our circuit? Absolutely horrible. Any good markers here? That one's a good one. Sure, so assure circuit soundness. What's the best way to do this? Go through and do what? Check it over. We have something that we use to make sure we check it over and that's called what? Pre-bypass checklist. Of everything we're gonna talk about today, priming a circuit, the most important part has nothing to do with priming. This is it. You have to make, you have to be absolutely assured your circuit is sound, especially in the case of emergency. Remember when I talked about my brother, pilot up in Duluth, Minnesota, getting out and checking everything on the airplane before we take off again, even though we just landed like five minutes, if it's negative 18 degrees and the wind's howling, because you get 5,000 feet off the ground and something's failing, you're hosed, you're hosed. We wanna make sure we fix and, and catch anything before we ever prime, before we ever go on bypass. So number one, most important thing, here's the other thing. He, as a student, students have been dismissed from our program by checking something on your checklist and not having checked it. I wanna, uh, I can't overstate the importance that if you make a mark on that checklist, you better believe that that is correct and checked because if, if something fails, and they trace that back and you checked it and it wasn't checked, it wasn't right, there's no one you can blame but yourself. That falls back completely on you. You can't blame a vendor, you can't blame a surgeon, you can't blame anyone else but the person who signed that checklist and made that mark. Really, really important. Okay, so we got that, got that ready. The second thing we need to do. Now, this is where that variability comes in. Very different from when I grew up in perfusion to now. What did we use? 
It's one of our labs a couple of labs ago. What did we use that maybe we don't use now? Arterial line. An arterial line filter. Why is it, why is this process different than it was then? What do we have now? Integrated, right? But regardless of whether we have an arterial, an exterior arterial line filter, or an integrated arterial line filter, what is good practice, especially if this is not emergent, to do to your circuit prior to priming? CO2 flush. What's that? CO2 flush. CO2 flush. Why? Why? High solubility of CO2 um, absorbs air bubbles into solution. That all comes down to solubility, right? If we have air in our circuit, it's better to have it be CO2 than oxygen because any bubbles are going to go into solution. Any bubbles are going to go into solution. Make sense? CO2 flush. If you have time, why not? There's no real harm to it. So you might as well do it. Is it as effective on an integrated arterial line filter as an exterior? Probably not, but that's kind of a moot point. We're not arguing that. It's still better than not doing it. So we're gonna CO2 flush. At the same time we're CO2 flushing, I'm gonna go A and B. We have a couple other checks we can do at this point in time. What do we need to do to our oxygenator? And I'm gonna bring up two methods two methods because one's better than the other, although if you use one or the other, that's why I have A and B, they're both efficient. Let's gas check and water test our oxy. While we're CO2 flushing, prior to priming, you can do a gas check on your oxygenator, make sure it holds the, our membranes intact, then we can hook up our water lines, do a water test of our oxygenator prior to make sure water's not crossing the barrier, that there's no leak inside of our oxygenator. Why is it important to do that now before we drop prime? It's real hard to tell the difference between water coming into your oxygenator or your prime because they're both clear and essentially water, right? Once you drop prime, it's impossible to tell if water's crossing the barrier coming in or out until you get blood through it and then your water may become rosé or water going into your blood, which is way worse. Make sense? How important are these first two steps before we even prime? Pretty dang important, right? Pretty darn important because this is safety. This is on your pre-bypass checklist. This is what we're doing. Okay, now the third step is something some people will do and some people will not. But I think it's a pretty important step. And we will teach what in my simple mind is the most important thing. I've got a lot of great ideas up here. <laughs> my idea is so packed, my brain so packed, so dense with ideas, I could argue I'm the most dense person in this room. <laughs> uh, the, the third step we are gonna teach to isolate circuit parts. What's that mean? That means to put clamps in different places before you drop prime so that the prime just doesn't right down and through. The reason I teach this is because when you prime with the centrifugal pump, this is imperative. When you prime with the roller pump, you can essentially drop prime and prime the whole thing kind of all at once. But priming with the centrifugal pump, you have to do this. Because if you drop prime and it goes right down into your centrifugal pump when there's air and and there's prime and that thing, it makes it infinitely harder to prime. It's a lot easier to isolate circuit parts, put clamps on different places. Uh, you can choose where that is. We can have Amber teach us and show us how she primes her circuit with this centrifugal roller. While we're doing that, I'll say, hey, here's another think about this when we do that. But the bottom line is have a method to all this and do it repeatedly and do it the same every single time. That way, third case, middle of night, midnight, you had another case, you're so tired, you do things the same way, you don't have to think about priming. It's so natural, it's like brushing your teeth before bed. Right? So we're gonna isolate our circuit. Now, we're finally at that point where we can drop prime. Four steps here before we even started to prime our circuit, before we even get fluid into our circuit. 
See why this is more important and it's a bigger deal than just, hey, prime it up. Well, a lot goes into just prime it up, right? Now we drop prime. What is arguably the most important part of our AV loop, which we're gonna use to prime next, because right now the prime is in our reservoir, right? When we drop the prime, it's in our reservoir. What comes next? What do we prime first? Uh, Kelly, I think you said it before. The pump. Prime pump. Why would we prime our pump first? Because gravity prime is only going to do so much, right? We're going to need some forward mechanism to prime the rest of our circuit. And what's the components of our AV loop, which we said is the most important? Our pump, our oxygenator, and the tubing from A to B, arterial venous, right? So first part of that is the pump, right out of our reservoir, right into our pump. What's the second thing we prime then? Think about the AV loop. Pump, pump. oxygenator. Prime oxy. When we do prime oxy, what are we gonna flow through? AV loop still clamped and isolated because we don't want flow to just go right through our AV loop, still clamped. Or what? Recirc open. We will deal with shunts in a couple labs, maybe right after Christmas. Uh, why is the recirc line in our circuit? For safety, to get rid of bubbles. And when is the recirc line supposed to be open? During priming. Closed when you're done priming. That's the purpose of the recirc line. Usually it's at the top of the oxygenator. What rises in fluid? Bubbles. Where's it go? Out of the recirc line, out of the oxygenator. When we prime, back into our reservoir. Now our oxygenator, you can kind of bump it a little bit, shift it a little bit. Don't bang on it and break it, but bump it a little bit. Make sure those bubbles, if any bubbles are hung up, they go through our recirc line. The next part, the AV tubing, right? We are essentially now with the AV line primed that they're messing with the patient up there and all at once the patient goes into asystole or some kind of deadly arrhythmia. We can push our pump on and as fast, push our pump up and as fast as they can get cannulas in that patient, we can now go on and save their life, correct? We can do all of this in probably three minutes. And now we've got our AV loop primed. Everybody with me? Okay. Next things now. How important is the rest of this stuff? Arguably, it's important because we're going to use it. But the meat and potatoes now is done. We've got that thing primed and debubbled. What else now? What, what, what else can we prime? Off of our oxygenator. It's important. Plegia. What's that? Cardioplegia. Yep, our cardioplegia. Um, I'm going to say cardioplegia slash emo concentrator. If we have one, we know we're going to use it. Now's the time to prime those ancillary things. Right? Now's the time to prime those ancillary things. So, cardioplegia, hemo concentrator, uh, any ancillary things. Our purge line needs to be primed, our, our research line is primed, our cardioplegia, anything else, our, our hemo concentrator. Couple more steps that go into priming. So now we're circulating through this, right? Circulating, making sure every, all the, everything's debubbled, everything's primed. Now's a good time to test what? What can we test at this point in time? Pressure. Yep, prime pressure. Pressure. Domes. And check the pressure. Great. What what next? Because yeah. now you're thinking about this. What, what's that? Temperature. Temperature. Let's do three things. Temperature, safety things. Bubble detector and level detector. Temperature, bubble detector, level detector. Check them now right, in the priming. Can we do bypass without those things? Absolutely. Can we save somebody's life without those things? Absolutely. But if we have time to check them, and if we find out if they're gonna fail, now's the time, right? Before we go on bypass, before we take off in the plane. So we're gonna say 10 is, well, running out of room. Temp, level, 
and bubble. Great. Those are 10 steps. You could break these into 15 steps if you want to. You could make A and B different steps. You could make this step three different steps. It's not, a, it doesn't matter. The key is you have to do different steps. You have to take different steps in this process to get to the now point where your level detector's on, your bubble detector's on. Those are things you can turn off because we're gonna wrap and we're gonna bap, right? And sometimes those things will sense that clear to blood to clear is a bubble or a change in our level. We're gonna bring that level all the way down below our level detector prior to going on bypass. We're gonna do things that we know as a smart perfusionist are things to do for our patient, but we can check them now and then we can turn them back on so that we know when we hit, hit that level detector on or that bubble detector on once we go on bypass, which we'll teach an initiation when that happens, that those are functional and ready to go. Now we're circulating basically the last step, which can be or is not necessarily part of priming, depending on the way you look at it, would be to right before they go to cannulate at this point in time, we have to do what to our circuit? We need to clamp the circuit, venous and arterial. After you clamp venous arterial, pop your venous clamp a little bit and then clamp it off. Why? Because what are they gonna do up at the field now? Divide your tubing. Why would we want to clamp venous arterial and then pop our venous open just a little bit? Because we leave that venous clamp open and we were just with a centrifugal pump, pumping and had a pretty high pressure and then clamp. What's the pressure between our clamps in that AV loop? 200, 250 maybe, depending on the way our priming went. What happens if they divide the lines up there? Hits them right in the face, right? How, how kindly do you think surgeons look at you as a perfusionist if the first thing they do as a case is get sprayed in their glasses in their face right over the, ster the surgical sterile field? Where do you think the headlight is next? On you, right? Like, who's the nut behind the grip back there? Like, is this your first rodeo? Have you ever done this before? So you can take those steps knowing the process. The last step is, is clamp AV. Pop venous for a second. Well, let's go, instead of pop the venous, let's go flash the venous. Flash the venous clamp. All that means is bleed the pressure off. All that means is open that venous clamp, make sure that when they divide the lines, and then you can tell them at the field, because they'll be asking, you can tell them, We're, I'm clamped back here, you can divide, you may divide whenever you're ready. That tells them, hey, they got this under control, I'm not gonna get sprayed in the face, I've done all of these steps prior to going on bypass. Any questions over this process and how this looks? Any questions? Seems pretty simple, right? Great, we are gonna prime these two circuits that you guys created. We're gonna go through these steps. We're gonna see how, how there are little differences between the centrifugal circuit and between the roller circuit. And then it's up to you guys to practice, 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 practice. The next lab you will see is going to be bumping or pushing up to the cannula. You see how that's the next step. If I were to push 12, put 12 up here, that would be the next step, right? When they have cannulas in, next week we will teach how to properly bump with the roller pump, with the centrifugal pump, how that process works. Because there's some finesse in there. I'll teach you different things that I have been taught by different perfusionists throughout my career that make that process a little easier without spraying the surgeon or anyone else uh, at the field with water. Sound good? All right, let's, um, let's kind of gather around here. Good. Yeah, good.